Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. science. Usually this thing's kind of like an unfolding lawn chair. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's just clunky. So, uh, you know, we'll see how this goes. (laughs) <laughs> I think we know how it's going to go. <laughs> this is not our first rodeo? Is that what you're trying to say, Will? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I guess the ones that, that it works for are still here listening to us, and the ones that it didn't work for have already moved on to something else. And They've already fine. bought a new lawn chair. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, but we're uh, we're getting a little piggy today, so <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll draw some of them back in. Uh-oh. Well... I felt like our recent episode on coyotes has stimulated some interest. Sure. So we figured why not just move right on to wild pigs. Yeah. Do you think you think pigs are more or less hated than coyotes? Oh man. That's an excellent question. I think we should poll the audience on that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's which one's hated more. I'd have to say pigs from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that one. I feel like I always hear, you know, I never hear any, anybody say anything good about coyotes, but, you know, I the this, this bad stuff I hear about pigs is always way worse. <laughs> yeah. Well, Matt, we appreciate you being here, and I think your last name's McDonough? Is Mc, that? Yeah, McDonough, yeah. McDonough. Okay. Yeah. I don't pronounce anybody's name right, so please don't be offended. <laughs> It's all right. I get it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we're really glad to have you here. And can you give us a little bit of your background? I know that your your work has been on pigs and how they affect turkeys. But what else about you? What what would our audience like to know about you? Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm originally from uh, Syracuse, New York, and I applied for a position down at Auburn to, doing my master's with wild pigs. And investigating you know how wild pigs influence kind of our native species here in the southeast and specifically what we were looking at was deer and turkey and you know when you go in and you remove a bunch of pigs what happens to to everything else around there and we had a couple other projects stem off and i've i've uh since since finished my master's and i've been doing doing some pig research here and there some other projects as as, uh i'm kind of stumbling along trying to feel my way through the field you know (laughs) okay yeah so you stumbled your way into a PhD now, is that right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's and what I was still... going to ask. So, so have you moved into a PhD program now? Uh, actually, just, yeah, just started this semester, actually. Oh, yeah. okay. And you're doing that with Steve Ditchkoff, right, mm-hmm. still? And, oh, yeah. and you, work, you also worked with Steve for your master's as well, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. I've kind of I've kind of been working with him, him for the most part all, all throughout um, my time here at Auburn, so. Mm-hmm. So is your PhD work on pigs or deer or that's uh, that's kind of up in the air yet. It's probably, you know, it's probably going to be a mixture of whatever I can get my hands on honestly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I asked you beforehand, but I wanted to ask you now so the audience can hear your answer. So are you a pig guy or a turkey guy? I'd say I'm definitely a pig guy. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what. That's fine, man. I you know <laughs> You know, somebody's got to be a pig guy, and if there's going to be one, Matt's a killer. So that's right. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad to have him on our team in that regard. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we need all types. That's right. So I won't hold it against you. <laughs> hey. hey uh, Don't be wrong. Yeah. I like turkeys too. <laughs> yeah. I'm about having more turkeys, and if that means having less pigs, then I'm about that too. Kind of works out that way, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to tell us, aren't you? That's right. <laughs> So one of the things that I I wanted to start out with, Matt, is kind of, um, you know, laying the groundwork for going into into your the specifics of your study Um, and setting it up. I mean, 
it was a very strong experimental design. That was one of the things that first struck me um, when I started reading through the paper. But it was a before after control impact design, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so we we had um, we had three treatment sites and one control site, and they were all very very close to each other, um, kind of in just in a squ- little square down in south south central Alabama, and what we did was we went out before we ever did anything. We ran some camera surveys um, and kind of established like a baseline of like, okay, this is what our, what our turkey populations look like on each of these individual sites and overall. And then we went in and we worked with, we were working with USDA wildlife services and removed, removed a lot of pigs. We ended up removing like close to 1900 pigs over the course of this study. And the whole time we were doing this, as we were progressing, we were doing camera surveys where, we were try- looking at the uh, turkey populations and ha- you know where where we were in that removal relative to the baseline and how the how that was a f- like how the turkey populations were changing and the response to that on the treatment sites. But the whole time we were leaving the control alone and kind of just letting it do what it does to con- control for any annual variation that you get with reproduction or just in general and just using all that to com- we compare that in a model and see what mm-hmm. see how that everything was shaping out really yeah so so matt let me ask you a couple questions about that uh one so can you kind of describe how many years of data on either side so did you have so we started off we had um we had one year of baseline data and then we did two years while we were actively removing pigs on the treatment sites and what we did was we we did um we did a survey in the summer where we were spe- specifically like trying to target poults. And as mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys know how difficult that can be to get on camera. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then, then we were doing another, another spring survey. that was a, a pre hunting season survey to get it, you know, to get an estimate in the spring before harvest and, um, you know, any rapid changes in population coming from that, just specifically in regards to the males being harvested. Yeah. And we, so we had, we had two camera surveys on on each site prior to our beginning of the removals, and then we just did that annually. And so then these camera surveys were they were done for a week after a week of pre baiting. So we were, we were, we we went out and we put we were keeping bait on the ground the whole time just so that like turkeys and everything else was getting used to feeding in those areas before we even put the camera out. And what that mm-hmm. did was that kind of made it that made it easier for that was an established feeding area for these turkeys and mm-hmm. it was, it, it was easier to get them coming back and there was a way to kind of, you know, make them more detectable. I gotcha. So how, how large were the areas? Uh, so the, there were, I think in total, it was like 40 something thousand acres, um, of which about 35 was the treatment sites and five was the control site, control site. So, okay. so yeah, 10,000 down... acre plus, Sorry. Yeah, I have down uh, from the methods that the smallest site was like seventy five hundred acres. So yes. these are pretty these are pretty large areas. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I figured they were pretty large because you said there was almost two thousand pigs removed or something yeah. like that. Nineteen hundred. Uh, so in those, were were you using the camera surveys also to measure pig relative abundance of pigs in some way? So or how how were you determining the effect size of your treatment i guess so what what we did was we kind of uh we just before we started our removals we ran a very intensive survey and we actually ended up going in and individually identifying each pig that we were getting on the camera survey and we, what we were doing was we had these cameras spaced in a way that it was smaller than a home range so we were able to pick up the same pigs on different cameras mm. and what that allowed us to do was establish uh two things a it was giving us a minimum census where it was a assumed census where you know this is the absolute we at least know that there are these many pigs on each site and they were you know we could compare to each other and say this is the density on this site relative to this site to the, relative to this site but in addition to this in terms of our removals what that helped us do was say okay we know this group of pigs is using this area and we can go in and target them and make sure that we remove the, this group of pigs from that area and so it gave us a more selective and scientific approach to going in and removing these sounders of pigs from these areas to try to create, you know, little pig free pockets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, 
one of the things that I was curious about, Matt, is um, where where would you say that those study areas rank in terms of like pig density compared to, to you know like maybe the average across the southeast? Are we talking about is this a high density area, pretty average, somewhere in between? Or who knows? So we had our control site was about about average for the southeast as well as one of our other treatment sites, and then we had. Yeah, that's normally about nine pigs per square kilometer. And we had another one that was slightly lower at six pigs per square kilometer. And then our, our third treatment site was close to double that. And it was about 16 pigs per square kilometer is what we estimated it at. So this one was just swamped with pigs. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Wait, did was you... it, so the one that that was had a pile of them, how, how many was that? What was the density? The density was 16 pigs per square kilometer. All right, how many Alabamas is that? <laughs> uh, what what is that per square mile? Like two point uh, four times. Yeah, 16? so that would be like thirty thirty five ish per square okay. mile. Yeah, that's a decent deer density. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I was gonna say that, that's a lot of pigs. <laughs> That's a I guess pile of them. I guess some of them are little, right? They're, yeah, they're yeah. Like, we 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 were counting uh, them all the little ones, big ones, all of that. So yeah, it's, you know they'll. Eventually, they're going to be the big ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Weird how that works out, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I think um, I'm curious about, and I know a lot of our listeners would be too, is the removal techniques that y'all were using. Yeah. So so we were using, um, we did a mixture of uh, remote traps where we were using the phone activated, where you had a camera up and you could watch them all go in and actually mm-hmm. manually drop the trap. And right. those, those were very nice for the, the whole sound. We were doing whole sounder removal. Sure. So it was very nice for that because it's you're actively looking at what's going in there. And uh, you're able to just say, okay, they're all in there and drop this trap. Mm-hmm. The, the downside to that is that that's normally happening at about 3 a.m. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So you're always having to, you know, you're having to pattern them, set an alarm and wake up to get that. So. Well, it is, it's it's very beneficial and a very clean way to do it. It's 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 tough if you don't have the the people willing to do it or the manpower to do it. Right. And then we didn't have cell service in all the areas we were doing. Actually, most of it. So the way we got around that was we were using um, guillotine doors uh, in cattle panel traps, mm-hmm. and we would set them on a trip line. We would, we had the trip line in a way that we could adjust it to the height of the the biggest pig in the air in the in the sounder. So there's been studies that have been done where not all the time, but for the most part, that biggest pig is usually the matriarch. And it's usually the last one to go in and yeah. cause in terms of like feeding costs and all and costs associated with feeding and everything. So the little ones get to go in and they can run around underneath the trip line without setting it off and keep feeding. And then once that big one's like, okay, it's good enough to go in, you, you know, they set it off and traps, traps the group. And yeah. so we, we were doing that. And then in addition to that, what, uh, we had wildlife services come out and they were, they were doing some aerial removals where they were taking the helicopter out and they were, you know, flying over these sites and they were finding pigs and, and taking them out. And that, that, that really helped, uh, benefit, benefit our removals, especially on, on some of the sites where the densities were really high and it was, you know, they'd flush them out of these tall grass areas and they were able to do a good job with that, I think. Mm -hmm. So would you say that most of them were, were removed via trapping and then, I mean, like, how does it break down in terms of the uh, relative proportion between techniques? So I would say it was probably. And if I'm getting, I may no, get down too far in the weeds on some of this. If so, you're good. I'm just you know trying to do some mental math here. Okay. It's I would that, say probably, that's one of the things that we're known for. Yeah, it's getting too too far down in the weeds. No, for doing no, mental the math. math. Oh, the math. <laughs> that too. Yeah. I, I would say probably about uh like. 80s 80 to 85 percent were removed from uh trapping and only only a handful from helicopter and part of it is that where we are in alabama um there's so many tall trees around and heavily forested canopies right that you can't get the same results you can in areas like texas where there's a lot more open it like you know they're running them through plains they can really get on them or like low shrubs and it's easier to get on get on them and stay on them Whereas here, once they get into those tall trees, it's like you can't you can't see them, you can't get in, you can't get down on them and everything. So it's just it's harder it's harder in this kind of the land kind of landscape that we are doing it in to use that helicopter. Sure. So it's mm-hmm. it's entirely dependent. Like the efficacy is entirely dependent on the area that you're in. So yeah, 
Well, one of the things that we always like to do, and the reason I asked that question is we try to put the um, like results from any study that we discussed within the context um, so that a landowner could understand, you know, what the realist, realistic expectation takeaways are, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that came to mind for me is um, these were, you know, you had a minimum 7,500 acre trapped area. Most landowners are going to be much smaller than that. So their ability to control a population is going to be less than it would mm -hmm. be if it was a larger property. And again, like we talk about this every time, I'm not trying to discourage folks. I'm just trying to give you realistic yeah. expectations. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like with the trapping that, you know, if y'all were removing 80, 85% of them with corral traps, um, and particularly with the trip wires and not, you know, always using the uh, remotely activated gates, then that's something that would be achievable by the landowner. Yeah. yeah. A lot and the, more accessible at least. Yeah. Yeah. And then a lot of it goes into how you do it too. Um, habituate, like finding, finding areas where there's, you know, identifying what pigs are out there, finding the areas they're using and habituation to the trap is I think the biggest thing that is going to benefit landowners looking to remove the pigs. You, know, you got to monitor it, make sure that they're all comfortable going in because they'll, they'll learn if the, you know, you trap the small group, but you'll make that, that bit that wasn't that, those that sow or, um, whatever, whatever part of that group wasn't trapped, they'll get a lot more, I guess, spooky around these traps mm -hmm. if they watch the door drop and, mm -hmm. you know, they have that negative experience. So you're kind of getting, getting them all comfortable in the trap before it's set is a, is a big part of a, a successful trapping program, I think. Yeah. And yeah. I guess even if you don't have cell signal, you can do that with a standard trail camera. Exactly. You have to go back out there to bait anyway, so you can pull your SD mm -hmm. card and, and figure out, you know, when the sounder tends to be uh, getting comfortable with the trap and going in at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So uh, in the interest of providing context as well, I was kind of, I think what Will and I did this on a different episode, like related to trapping nest predators or something. So you, and correct my my memory if I'm wrong, but you removed 1,900 pigs or so, didn't you say? Yeah, roughly, yeah. And that was about 30,000 acres collectively? Mm -hmm. So what is that, like a pig per 15 acres or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah that sounds about right. <laughs> um, is that right, Will, or why are you laughing at me? Just you trying to do math like that on the fly. I mean, <laughs> more power to you, buddy. Yeah. So I think that's important for context because you're t you're kind of expressing the density of pigs that you're removing, right? Yeah. And uh, people can kind of scale that to what they're operating with. So maybe yeah. they only have a thousand acres, and uh, you know, the that's the number of pigs. I guess over a two year period. So. Uh, yeah. One thing to keep in mind about it too, though, is that the way that pigs use a landscape is they're not always like evenly distributed because of sure. how they're socially structured. So like, you know, you, that, 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 uh, density isn't like, oh, there's a pig, there's a pig here, 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 and here. It's like, there's 20 pigs here, all grouped together in one sounder and they're, they're moving through the area and they have, you know, they have a core area and their, their territory and, Mm -hmm. Because of how they interact with other groups, they usually create these little, they carve these little pockets out for themselves. And so you're not getting, they have the areas they like and they'll stray from those areas, but they, they kind of tend to really be tightly, tightly packed in, in certain areas. So, so can you, Matt, can you just take, and, and you don't have to go into extreme detail, but I, I've gotten curious enough from some of the things that you've said to, to try to uh, get you to walk us through for our listeners, like if you're stepping foot on a property that has a pig problem for the first time, how are you going to approach that problem? So the first thing I'm, I'm, I'm going to do is before I even put any traps out or anything is I'm going to go out there and I'm, you know, if it's a big enough property, well, in general, normally what I'll do is I'll put out cameras with baits and I, I space them, you know, about one every Two at like two per square mile, I guess would be two cameras per square mile or so. Probably a little bit, little bit, a little bit denser, I guess. I was trying to do the mental conversion in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous. Yeah, that's that's right. And uh, I'll put I'll put bait I'll put you know bait out for I'll do do a week of 
pre baiting where I'm just putting bait out, getting everything. Yeah. And because pig pigs, once they find a bait pile, I'm sure a lot of a lot of people know this. Unfortunately, is they'll just keep coming back and keep coming back to that food source. And so they'll once they get that established as a food source, kind of similar to what I was talking about with how we did the turkey surveys, mm-hmm. is um you then you can get then put the camera up and I mean sometimes they'll be there a couple times a day, just the same group, and you'll really get to see like okay, this this group is this is who's here, this is what we have on the property, this is where where they're using, where they like to use, like if they're moving to if they're using multiple cameras, like which one do they come to more kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then again, what's the, what that kind of gives you is a list of like, okay, these are, these are who's, who's, who's where and who's associated with who. So that you can go out and make sure that you're really targeting those whole groups and not, not leaving a sow there that, you know, is going to hang around and reproduce and just kind of start a new group, but be harder to trap. And okay. so after that, what, what, and also with that is that you'll also establish a feeding area that you can then set a trap on. So then you can start building, usually you try to do it slowly, is start building that trap around the pigs as we're baiting, get them, really get them feeding up next to it or crossing the threshold of the door. Because we found that the threshold is really a big, um, it's it, it kind of discourages some of these pigs a little bit. But once you can get them feeding through that threshold, you know, you can kind of start building a trap up around them and make sure that they're all comfortable feeding in. And, you, you know, sometimes sometimes they go all go right in, sometimes they take a little time. And once they're comfortable with that, you can, you know, set the trap. You're watching on your phone and drop the trap once they're all comfortable going in there and kind of remove them all in one go. And the biggest thing that we found, because we we removed a lot more, ended up by the end of the 22 months, we removed a lot more pigs than we actually estimated at first. And a lot of that was because we were doing this over, you know, two years. And so you're getting a lot of reproduction. You get some of these younger sounders that split off and, you know, they, they go searching for these new, they go searching to establish newer territories. Mm-hmm. And so you really need to monitor after you remove those pigs. Cause you may have, you may be pig free for, you know, a couple months, a year, but eventually like if you, if you're, if there's pigs all around you at some point, it's, they're going to filter into that area again. So you kind of got to really monitor and stay on top of it. And also, I guess working with your neighbors is a good way to go about it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah the more people, absolutely. The more people you can get on board, the easier it is to manage that. Yeah. And it's, are you building those corral traps out of like the, the welded wire fence panels or something different? Yeah. Um, so I didn't actually, we didn't actually end up building those. Those are, those were provided by uh, uh, wildlife services mm-hmm. and it's kind of just a, a thin wire or not a thin wire, a, a welded wire to a, to a like, big metal steel frame yeah and uh we were using metal metal doors with just plywood drop or or metal gates with plywood drop doors on them Mm -hmm. and that 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 worked out pretty well it kind of it was rigid enough that it could hold them and um for our we we were using the jaeger pro systems back for our cellular stuff so we were using that whole there i think they have aluminum panels Mm-hmm. and the the big eight foot doors and th- those work really well too but that i think that that wi- welded wire with the frame was really structurally sound but you mm-hmm. can do the same thing with just flexible cattle panels and, and some t-posts too it's gonna it's gonna have the same effect so okay so matt when when you were doing the the camera surveys i presumably you're getting pigs on those right did you look at the detection rate or something something with the cameras before and after the removals like can you give us a sense of how much the removal like what was the effect it had on the pig population so there were there was definitely some ebb and flow and depending on how we it was it was depending on how and where we were looking so on our on our surveys we were there were some areas you know we'd go in and we remove a pigs and or, or remove a group of pigs and we wouldn't see pigs again for a year and there were other areas where it seemed like it was constant. You know, we'd remove a group and then a couple of weeks later, it's, there's another group there. And that, so it, it was really kind of dependent on how far it was from the border and the habitat type as to how quickly they were coming in. But there's def, there's always this, this period of time after where you're not, you're, we didn't see, you know, we wouldn't see anything. It's like we plucked that group yeah. out and it created this little, this little vacuum of no pigs. And there was, we yeah. were, so we were kind of plucking these groups out and creating these little, vacuums or these little these little pockets where we weren't having any pigs 
mm-hmm. for a certain amount of time. But it was it, it's it's tough to say how long that period of time is on the landscape. So Okay. Well, should we uh, talk about how it affected turkeys? Yeah, the big yeah. reveal, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> We've been going on for jump right into it, Matt. T- Twenty minutes without telling people what happened. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah uh, kind of alluded to it earlier a little bit. Um, <laughs> so we ended up finding that um, as we were removing these pigs and creating those those little pockets where we weren't weren't having pigs for a while was uh, we were finding that not only were we seeing more turkeys, but they were more comfortable feeding at these bait sites. So we, these bait sites were kind of a proxy, you know, they're, they're an area where there's a bunch of food and a little space kind of similar to a feeder or an oak tree or any of those like spatially limited, um, feeding sites. And so you can kind of think of that as a proxy. And we kind of found that they were, they were come, they were fine. They were coming to the cameras in the first place more, but even, even better was that they were continually coming back more. And it was, mm-hmm. it was, it was a more common occurrence that they were going to show up and like come back the next day and the next day and the next day as we were removing these pigs. And so we saw our detection, our detection actually doubled. So the way we, we, the way we measured our, our F, our uh, wild pig removal was we compared how many pigs we removed at the time of survey to the baseline and kind of did that as a, a relative measure of the pig removal. So if you had like a hundred pigs pre and you removed 80, you would say it was an 80% reduction. That's yeah. So it, okay. it's not a true, cause there's reproduction happening and all that. Sure. So it's not like a true, it's hard to track that throughout time right. um, at, with, with what we had in the area we were covering. So we were using that as kind of like an index to say, okay, well, you know, this, this, we, while we remove, you know, there's areas like on the site where there's nine pigs per square kilometer. If I, you know, we get, get rid of a hundred pigs on there, it's going to have a different effect than on the area where there's 16 pigs per square kilometer. So it was kind of like a way to standardize the removal to the, to the prior densities on these sites to be able to say, okay, well there's more, you know, this is how much of an, an effect was we were having, how much, like how successful our management was on this site versus this site. And so what we were finding was that when we were removing the same number, like when our removals got to the point where we had removed the same amount of pigs that we estimated the baseline, our detection for turkeys actually doubled on these camera sites. And as, as you started removing more and it was like a more longer term, more intense management, it actually, it was, it, it just got higher and higher and higher. But that was, that was the way we thought about it was, you know, when, if we had a hundred pigs at once we got to the point where we removed a hundred pigs, we were seeing that, that turkeys, uh, they were they were twice as detectable on camera on these bait sites, and y'all actually try y'all actually um, looked at pults specifically as well, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So with with pults, what we saw was um, we started our removals in March. So you know, getting into it and, every, and all that, it it we're one uh, the time the time frame of it really wouldn't have had an effect on that that first year. So we're mm-hmm. the net the nesting season that first year is kind of. Con- it's it was a it was a tough time to start with that but what we found was that actually in our second year we started seeing that there were you know there were we were seeing pults in more areas than we were prior so we we had pults on our control site but we didn't have any detections on our treatment sites even during the baseline until the second year after we started removals and kind of what we what we are thinking and what some other research has shown that's come out since is that you know these the it's really these adults selecting for area moving into these areas and selecting for these areas and you know nesting and uh it's not not there the the jury's not really out on on the nest depredation as much as it as what we think it is is um these turkeys coming into these nesting areas and being like oh this is a better nesting this is a better nesting habitat because i'm not getting disturbed by pigs you know it's this is or whether they're getting pushed out or whether they're just selecting for less pressure in that way um we kind of we're kind of thinking it's the it's the adults moving in and setting up nests rather than nest survival or anything of that sort so in other words you think turkeys just don't like to nest where there are pigs not that when there were a bunch of pigs they were eating all the nests yeah because there's there have been studies that have been done that looked at like true a bunch of stuff with artificial nests and then true turkey nests and Mm-hmm. The stuff with the true turkey nest, there's 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 years where they get absolutely hammered, and there's then the other years where it's not so much. So it's kind of 
it seems like it's it's not really clear in that regard as to how that you know how that's shaping out mm-hmm. and so we but what we've we've kind of hypothesized with that it's it's more so adults being like okay this is a better area now because we're you know this this disturbance is being managed more yeah so to speak yeah that's god there's a lot to unpack here (laughs) (laughs) i feel like and and dive into um but as a scientist you know of course i want to understand that mechanism and have more clarity on is it a behavioral response like are they just behaviorally excluding turkeys from that area or is it maybe a combination of that with the numerical effects or the direct effects? But then as a land manager, I'm just like, I don't care. Like I want if more fewer pigs equals more turkeys, I don't care how it gets there. I know I need fewer pigs. So, so that was kind of what this research was, was, you know, we didn't get down and dirty with like how things were happening. It was more so like, you know, you hear about all these things, you hear about nest depredation, you hear about aggressive exclusion and resource competition. And it's like, in general like is there like does this interaction actually matter or is it just kind of something that like oh like you see like a pig eats a nest and it's not really doing anything or this these turkeys were like i'm getting out of this food plot because the pigs came in like you know we were just looking like overall does it matter kind of thing Mm -hmm. and it's kind of yeah just instead of just diving in and being like oh well it's this or this or this it's just in general is there an effect at all so so Matt, when you were speaking a few minutes ago, did I hear you say that there's some work forthcoming about real hen nests and depredation on, of pigs on those nests? Or uh, so, so we we weren't really looking at uh, we we've since done some research and some of the other grad students have done some research and it wasn't necessarily nest stuff that we were looking at. Um, specifically, we were looking at turkey movements in relation to pig management and so there was some you know gps we were putting gps units on on these turkeys and watching where they're moved as we were removing pigs and looking at like pig density relative to turkey movements and we're uh we're finding uh that these turkeys were selecting for like their daytime use was increasing in areas where pigs were like there was a lower density of pigs and they were they were selecting to roost in these areas where there was lower density of pigs and and they were nesting in areas where there was lower densities of pigs and they were the uh you know they were kind of more comfortable in general in these areas where you know there were less pigs mm-hmm. so it's kind of that kind of lend itself to sort of a mechan the mechanism we were talking about with you know it it's the it's the the movement and the distribution of adults on the landscape in relation to um these pig densities and how you're managing these, these pigs and everything. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe you're, um, you, you would know, but are, are there any studies that have shown on real hen nests that pig depredation is any significant proportion? You guys know I'm this? trying to recall. I think it's been documented, but I can't ever remember a study saying that pigs are responsible for the majority of it. Yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I, I don't even remember one where it was a significant proportion. I know that they've been documented on yeah, some of the simulated yeah. nest studies. Yeah. There's been a couple of times where it was relatively high on the simulated nests. But, and it gives me pa- that gives me pause, but, you know, yeah. we, we really don't know yet because a lot mm-hmm. of those real hens, real nest studies don't show the same. So mm-hmm. well, We definitely have, have tracked nests in places where there are pigs. Sure. Like, for example, in the Florida study, we have two years of data now on two sites. One of them has particularly many. I don't know what the density is to give you a comparison to what you were doing with Matt, but there are a lot of pigs around. And uh, I don't think we've had a nest that we suspect was pig-related, you know, loss. Mm -hmm. So that I, I guess I was bringing that up just to provide some additional anecdotal evidence that, you know, I think that data would probably be present because there's been quite a few nests in places where there are lots of pigs. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we'd probably know that it was a significant proportion of the nest loss if it was. Mm -hmm. Where So, uh, you know, I bring that up just to, provide some additional support i guess that maybe this is a behavioral 
mechanism. Maybe pig, t- turkeys just don't like pigs, so they still try to keep their distance from them. It's a behavioral yeah. exclusion rather than some direct impact on their reproduction. Yeah, I talk. You know, I, I I've talked with a lot of folks about this, and you know, some of them will get quite argumentative with you <laughs> about the the predation component of it. Um, but <laughs> Let me be clear, I'm not saying that I'm not concerned about, you know, pigs when it comes to turkeys. It's just that, you know, I think more about it from the behavioral exclusion, the resource competition, the exclusion from resource food resources. All of those things add up to enough for me. And you add on to that, like it diminishes your ability to do certain land management practices when there's lots of pigs, like particularly growing any kind of anything that has a grain or a root that is preferred by, you know, <laughs> yeah, pigs. I was gonna say and you so you add all that up, and that's you know sufficient justification for me to go scorched earth on them, regardless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, every I think everybody out there is probably in the same boat. If a pig finds a turkey nest, it will eat it. Mm-hmm. But yeah. the data, I haven't seen any compelling evidence that they're eating a lot of them. But uh, you know, it sounds like your data, Matt. Is, pretty strong suggesting that they are avoiding being around them. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of, kind of where it's fallen right now. Like say it's like you wake, we talked about there hasn't been a ton of evidence that they're, you know, just hounding nests or anything like anything of the sort, but we are, we have, we have kind of seen evidence that there, there's a behavioral change going on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I've gotten to see some of that data that, that Matt was alluding to earlier, and that was, you know, Travis Stokely's uh, master's project. And he's right. I mean, it, you, look at, you look at the density of pigs across the site based on their camera surveys, and you look at turkey movements, you know, based on GPS data relative to it. And, I mean, it's kind of like there's holes in, mm-hmm. in areas that, turkey, that turkeys just won't go because there are pigs there. Um, so, you know, you think about it from a landowner's perspective – you know, that really hurts because there's entire, you don't want it to be your property. <laughs> yeah, I, well, they, there's entire, there's entire acres of your property that, you know, turkeys may consider unusable just because of the, the presence of pigs. Yeah. It may be your whole property. <laughs> I yeah, mean, you, seriously. Yeah. You may, you may be one of those little pockets in there. <laughs> it may, it may depend on the feeder density of your property. <laughs> that, that, that I knew we were getting there. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just about to say if you know if you've got a if you've got a feeder out that pigs are hammering, you've just created a void in space used by turkeys. Oh yeah. <laughs> on, and to be clear, I, I, I would guess I would guess it is possible <laughs> to photograph because I'm sure there's a landowner somewhere screaming at us right now saying I've got a feeder that I get you know pig and turkey pictures on. And it's not to say that that's not still possible. It's just that you would probably have more turkey visitation if the pigs weren't there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those where it's, it's rare. It's going to, it's probably going to happen. I almost guarantee you something like you said, someone somewhere has got, got pictures of it. And it's, it's not to say that this is a hard and fast rule. Like they're never going to be near each other, but in general, as a, on average, I guess they were, they're probably not wanting to be around each other. Or, right. well, turkeys aren't wanting to be around pigs, so to speak. Right. And there, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I think that there's been a similar effect demonstrated for deer and pigs. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, another, another aspect of what, what I did was I looked at the same kind of similar structured study, but used, yeah. looking at, at deer with camera surveys. Okay. And we didn't, we didn't really see much of a population change, so to speak. Right. But we we were seeing that camera visitation and repeat visitation of deer was way higher as we were removing these pigs. Right. So so our detection our detection was going up and uh it was it was so as we were getting rid of these pigs, these deer were just like, Okay, you know, let's go to these feeding areas, this is a good spot to be, we're not getting messed with, we don't have to deal with deal with these pigs, let's just keep keep going back there. Cause this is, you know, this is kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it's pretty safe to say that, you know, your game species generally are, are, you know, staying, trying to stay away from pigs. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Is there anything else that you could think of that uh, a landowner could do to potentially, you know, mitigate pig damage or reduce abundance on their property? Like I said, obvi- obviously trapping and, <laughs> 
<laughs> is the biggest way to do it. Um, working working with the people around you is really important in that regard because the the more you can the more people you can get involved, the easier it's going to be to manage that landscape to to mitigate that damage. Um, short of putting a f fence around your whole place, though, it's it's tough to do, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And did y'all see an effect? Because I, I know some landowners might be hearing this and thinking, well, you know, I, I live three hours from my property. There's no way I could remove 100% of the pigs. Did you see a positive impact with some removal? Uh, yeah, I we did. I'd say any any removal really helps. Like I said, when you when you you kind when you start doing these whole is if you do it if you can get the whole sounder at once, you can kind of create like I said these pockets where it's okay. You get you know a few months here there in this area where it's you're not. You know, you may get a boar rolling through, but there's not really anything holding up and kind of affecting that area for a while. And you right. you can you can do it in a way where you can create these little pockets where you're you're at least lowering extremely lowering the pig density, if not completely getting rid of it in in an area because of how they are territorial and how they use their home ranges. So any any little any little bit really can helps, but I'd really just focus on if you're gonna do it, don't don't you know go go in haphazardly if you take care of the whole group all at once and you know yeah. make that area a little bit nicer for a while yeah that makes sense down with the pig <laughs> that's right <laughs> <laughs> you got anything else marcus well uh i can't think of any anything else i think we pretty well covered that study is there anything else matt that that you think we should have asked you or anything uh, you know uh to, for a take-home message um i think i think you guys about 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 covered it on honestly with the, okay. <laughs> some good questions you guys are throwing out <laughs> <laughs> We're on well i'm sure today. we, mi we right. missed a lot yeah Inter yeah. interrogation really huh? <laughs> <laughs> you felt like you were back in your defense uh, it hasn't been that long ago that's right <laughs> yeah well you're polished <laughs> so been, been uh, working on it <laughs> yeah well uh we really appreciate you coming and doing this hopefully it didn't feel like an interrogation <laughs> but uh we always like to to share the research i know you just got this published recently so we'll link that in the show notes and give people access to it and uh, otherwise, thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody out there for listening. We really appreciate all the, the support and the feedback. And this is one, another one of those, Will, that comes up pretty commonly. Yeah. People want to know about pigs. And I think a lot of that's coming from their spreading. And a lot of people have pig problems. Right. So they want to know what's going on. And uh, you know, I think you, you addressed, addressed that pretty well, Matt. Awesome. I appreciate you guys having me on to talk about it. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for your time, Matt. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org. Thank <laughs> you.